Hi everyone. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Just one thing really quickly. I know I'm still <clears throat> grading your quizzes and so the way this works is for every day late I am to get your quiz back to you, you get an extra credit point. So I will get your quizzes. You do get an extra credit point since I'm late, okay? If I don't get them back to you by tomorrow night, you'll get two extra credit points. That way I figure that um, no hard feelings and it's good motivation for me to get your quizzes graded, okay? So those should be done by tomorrow evening. Now, what we're talking about today are the early vertebrates. So when it comes to evolution, it's hard to follow the evolutionary trajectory of everything all at once. And so now the class is going to kind of break apart in a certain way in the sense that we're going to talk about the vertebrates, then we'll talk about the plants, then we'll talk about the insects, then we'll come back and talk about the vertebrates again, and you guys get the picture. So um, it's just a way to simplify things. So rather than bouncing all sorts of different directions, we can just kind of, you know, set a, a, set a course uh, in a straight line for a little while, and then we'll skip to another line and come back to the first line when we have time. So let's start with the early vertebrates. So we and all the other vertebrates are in the phylum chordata, okay? And so if you recall, all chordates are deuterostomes. This means that the anus develops first, okay? And I made the joke last time about the blastopore turning into the anus first, and the joke still stands. <laughs> so um, the groups above are just um, those that also belong in the phylum chordata with us, okay? So the vertebrates, that's where we sit. Um, the cephalochordates, neurochordates, and all sorts of other good stuff, okay? So all of these guys, um, you know, share ancestors with us. Now, in order to fit in the phylum chordata, you have to have all of these traits, um, not at the same time, but at some point in the life cycle, okay? So um, the critter has to have pharyngeal slits. Those are openings on the inside of the throat to the outside. They were used as gills for some species. Also have to have a dorsal nerve cord, okay? Bundle of nerve fibers run down the back. Have to have a notochord, that's a cartilage rod that runs underneath to support the nerve cord. And the post-anal tail, if you've ever broken your tailbone, that's what this is, okay? So now granted, if you think about humans, we don't have pharyngeal slits once we mature, but we do when we're an embryo, okay? so. Um, to fit in the phylum chordata, you have to have all of these traits at some point during the life cycle of that species. Now, as I'm sure there's no big surprise, there is some disagreement with regards to the phylogenetic relationship of the vertebrates and the tunicates and the um, uh, cephalochordates and so forth. And so there's a textbook view, there's molecular evidence. Um, what I just want you to be able to do is to look at this and realize that there's some controversy with regards to who's closest related to who, okay? And it's no big surprise, different type of data can show different patterns, and so, um, you know, this hasn't been solved yet, but eventually it will get figured out, hopefully. So Pikea were among the earliest fish, okay? And these are our ancestors. So they swam above the seafloor, they used their body, expanded tail fin, um, they did find these guys in the Burgess shale, so they've been around a long time, but they were relatively tiny and relatively simple to begin with, and that should make sense because it was the early evolution of the fish. So some paleontologists in China discovered what they felt were the earliest known fossil fish, okay, and their discoveries, of course, suggest that over time, the rate of evolution of these guys happened really, really quickly. Okay, and so somewhere about 50 million years before the current estimate when fish evolved, and so this is kind of another one of those, how old can you go? When did the earliest one actually evolve? And so I'm sure there's a little bit of um, uh, disagreement with regards to dating and so forth. But either way, the fish evolved relatively quickly, and it kind of makes sense why, because they filled this unique niche that, you know, was really convenient. Now, as far as fish go, there are some traditional classification um, that we've used. We've got the agnatha, which are basically the jawless fish. Okay, and then we have the nath nathostomata, which are the jawed fish. So the fish kind of fit into one of two groups. And the first group we're going to talk about, by the way, are the jawless fish. Now, lampreys fit into the jawless fish, and they're one of the last living relatives. And I'm not going to lie, these guys have a face only a mother could love, okay? And if I ever actually saw one up close on a fish, I think I would scream and go jumping out of the boat. <laughs> so, unfortunately, um, you know, they're, this is what they look like. And so they happen to have a bit of a parasitic lifestyle. 
Um, you can see that on the right, that's a picture of a mouth with basically nothing but teeth and a sucker. And what happens is they suck onto the side of a fish and then they'll start burrowing into the flesh with those teeth and they'll start sucking out the blood and the juice and anything else they can get it, um, energy from. And yes, they're gross, but you know, that's nature. Now the other group of jawless fish are the ostracods. And these guys actually look pretty cool. Okay, so they, again, they don't have jaws. Um, however, and at least not in the traditional sense, however, they had a lot of headgear which used to provide them with protection. And they came in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and this was definitely a cool group. Imagine, if you will, that you're staring at your favorite pizza, and you can't eat it because you don't have jaws, okay? So if this, you know, imagine, you can imagine this scenario, you should thank your fishy ancestors because they're the ones that actually evolved jaws first. So the current hypothesis suggests that jaws evolved initially from gill arches that over time um, developed more and more and more. Uh, initially though, the hypothesis suggests it was to help them to breathe because it would help them open their mouth much quicker and then close much quicker, which was force the water over the gills. Well, obviously there's a benefit to that though, because opening your mouth and then being able to close it, of course you can consume food better. So this is what the um, research suggests that jaws came from. So again, thank those fishy ancestors because without them we wouldn't be able to eat our pizza. So the next group we're going to talk about are known as the Nathostomata or the jawed vertebrates. These would include the ray fin fish, the lobe fin fish, placoderm group, and all sorts of other interesting critters. And uh, we'll start next with the placoderms because these guys are extinct but super awesome. Among the jawed fish, we're starting with the placoderms. These guys look like the ostracods because they also had a lot of armor on the front of them. And you can see that, of course, that's an advantage because it's going to be a defensive mechanism. However, they had paired fins and they had jaws, which is what made them fit into their own little group. So their backbone had a notochord that would persist throughout the life. And just like a lot of sharks, these guys were often made of cartilage, with the exception of the bony fronts and the jaws. Now the placoderms eventually had all sorts of different sizes and shapes and niches. Some of them lived at the bottom, others would float towards the top, some of them looked like missiles. You're not expected to know all of these, of course, but what I want you to know is that they did occupy a range of niches, and they looked really, really cool. Now another group of fish that have gone extinct but had jaws were the Acanthandotes. Now these guys were inappropriately named the spiny sharks um, because they did have membranes in their fins that were supported, supported by spines and they've long gone extinct but they actually looked pretty interesting too. Now the bony fish, okay, these are the interesting ones. And so today there's over 25,000 species of bony fish. They're found in marine, in water, and freshwater, and um, they make up the class Osteichthyes. Okay, now there's two different groups of them. There's the lobe fin fish, which we'll talk about soon, and the ray fin fish. Our ancestors, by the way, are the lobe fin fish because we ha share a lot of the same bones in our arms as they did in their limbs, which is pretty awesome. Now, among the lobe fin fish, we have a couple of interesting groups. So we have the lung fish, and yes, by the way, they did have lungs. Okay, some of them still exist today, and we also have the lobe fins. Lobe fin examples include the coelacanths and the rips and stidians. So these guys are interesting, because, and they're called the lobe fin because they basically have a humerus or a femur, okay, and a lot of musculature. And their limbs contain a lot of the same bones as ours do. So when it comes to our fishy ancestors, the lobe fins share a lot of traits with us, including a radius, an ulna, and several other bones. Um, and they also look relatively similar to the amphibians as well. Now, there's not many of them that are still alive today, as I said, the coelacan. However, the fact they're still alive means that they have eked out a living from an evolutionary perspective. Now let's talk about the ray fin fish. So these are the fish that we tend to know and love today because they're the ones that comprise about 25,000 different identified species. Okay, so they, um, you know, have really high diversity species number. They doing really incredibly well. The reason they're called ray fins is because of the fact that they don't have the same bones as the other fish did that we were, the lobe fin fish that we were just talking about. Basically their fins come out from little ray-like fingers on their sides and not 
having a radius, an ulna, or anything along those lines. Now, if we compare the lobes of our fishy ancestors, we see that we have the perch, where as I said, they have long, thin rays coming out. We've got the lungfish, which are lobe fins, and they have the radius and ulna like we do. And then we have the amphibian ancestors, which you can see what their bones look like as well. The other thing to consider, by the way, is the fact that the ray fin fish also have what's known as a swim bladder. And so what a swim bladder does is it gives the fish the ability to control its body position in the water. And you can imagine, if you're trying to escape a predator, think back to the Dory movie or Finding Nemo, you would definitely want to be able to move around in the water, control where your body position is, especially if you're trying to escape another predator. So if we have this nice little diagram, we can kind of compare, starting with the Cambrian, the Silurian, the Devonian, which is in a very interesting time, by the way, we'll come back to that later, going all the way up to the Cenozoic. Okay, and what I want you to notice is how the groups are doing and when they eventually started. Okay, so the jawless fish have been around for a while, placoderms as well, sharks came about the Devonian, ray fin fish came later, but now, of course, today they're doing incredibly well, as you know, as are the tetrapods. Okay, now, what I'm going to ask you guys to do for the rest of um, the time today, and I'm going to give you an extra credit point for turning this in. Um, it's very easy to get lost in the details of this class because we cover so many different details and it's hard to figure out um, you know, what happened first and then next and so forth. And so I want you guys to turn in a timeline with all of the events so far that we've happened, we've had happen in class, okay? So everything we've talked about. So 4.6 billion years ago, okay? Oh, I guess this should probably be worth maybe, let's say, five extra credit points. <laughs> it's going to be a big one. But what I'm wanting this to help you guys do is kind of organize your thoughts and realize what happened has happened over time. So start with, you know, formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago, talk about then, you know, the formation of the crust and then oxygen atmosphere, all sorts of other good stuff. And so um, I would like you to incorporate this and work on this today and then be able to turn it in on Wednesday night for those five extra credit points. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and I will talk to you soon.